I even thought about it. And then it was gone. So, you know, for the recording, for posterity. Hi, I'm Andrew. This is the Koha US Institute, and we're going to talk about administration and SQL and stuff. Does anybody have a cool thing they've done in administration that they're happy about? Conversely, a cool thing they've been trying to do in administration that they look forward to being happy about after some questions are answered by the group. Well, I have something with the new pages that I'm yeah. kind of pleased with myself about. Um, I don't want all of our staff. We have 19 libraries and 200 staff members, and not all of them need access to all of the reports. Sure. But you know, some of them need access to like, okay, here's the missing list of missing stuff. Go check the shelves. So without having any kind of real permissions to say you have access to these permissions but not these, what I ended up doing was using the pages to um load the data tables javascript and then using json pull the data from a report into a page and then nice. everybody can access without giving them permissions to access the report module so i can just publish these on the circulation page and say here's your reports go check your shelves or look for whatever you need to look for nice. so they have limited access to reports now that makes sense we've got um we have a report that we had volunteers using that, yeah, same kind of thing. That they needed to they needed to be able to run the report. It was like right. scan a barcode and get information about a single title. And we ended up having uh, Lucas at Bywater write a whole bunch of jQuery that like blocked the run of any other report. <laughs> logged in is that one volunteer user? Yeah, which like worked because it was we needed a a pretty simple solution. But I like your use of pages. Um, here let's just for the interest of show and tell. Uh, pages you technically wanna... live in tools mm -hmm. rather than, than admin, but seem like fitting. Uh, so in here with news and HTML customizations, there is now a pages tool that lets you just define. So I think we could already do this on the, the OPAC side. You could create more pages within the OPAC, or at least there, there was some way to accomplish that. There was a hack. Ah, okay. And now there's a thing. It's usually yeah. better than a hack. Yes, we don't the actually, hack became a thing. Yeah, we're a discovery um, Aspen. So we, when mm. we migrated last fall, we we're like, please don't turn on the OPAC. Do I have to turn on the OPAC? Yeah. Well, we deliver that. So I'm like, I'm like, you know, there's an OPAC hanging out there that no one ever does anything with. Yeah, we're in the same boat. We have a totally secret OPAC that won't show you anything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I've only got one page made here and it's uh, sort of similar to yours. It's I mm. wanted a place to stick some data that I'm pulling via jQuery. This is our, our program calendar. And it's just yeah. a page that lists all the programs. But yeah, I like the idea of, of throwing report data on there for somebody who wants to see report output but not run anything. Um, right. They just need to go to the page and it loads all the stuff they need for them. I do wish that this made that the pages got better URLs. It seems yes. like there would be the possibility of like a URL slug that you could custom define. Earls and some kind of table of contents yeah. thing, but you know, it's it's a start. Yeah. And it's a nice little thing. Like I, I look yeah. forward to seeing what else people do with pages. Yes. Well, cool. Thank you for sharing. I also have a negative thing that I ran into that I thought sure. it'd be a good idea to share. And I'm still I'm not 100% positive that what happened is what the source of the problem. Um, we use this, the batch patron modification plugin, so or permissions mod modification so that we can control permissions for groups of staff. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not entirely positive, positive what version causes this, or even if it is this tool that's causing it. But Friday afternoon, early around noon, we changed the configuration of that to remove one of the patron and list pairs that we didn't need anymore, the template list pairs. And at about 4.45, I realized that all the code in the internet user JS file that comes after the plugin code was gone, including all those reports that I had just created using these pages stuff. So fortunately, I'd backed it all up. 
and yeah, we were able to put it back. But if you're using that plugin, you might want to watch out. I'm not sure that's what happened, but that's the only thing I can think. Yeah. I mean, it, when I checked the log, like it said that I had deleted all my code at around the time that I changed the configuration. So I'm thinking that's the only thing I can think it was. So that's just a warning. Heads up for a scary thing. Yeah. So we put the we put all the code back above the <laughs> the, the the patron sure. modification plugin, but permission modification plugin. So hopefully it won't do it again. But we fortunately we had backup copies of all this stuff, so it wasn't. Yeah. So I missed. All the code. I missed part of that. You used the yeah. patron batch modification plugin, and it wiped yes. out all your jQuery. Um, anything you know in the there's a the plugin itself has some jQuery in yeah. that user. Anything after the that plugin was. Deleted. Oh, okay. Actually, that makes sense to me because the command that puts that in there appends it to what's already in there. Ah. So you want to yeah. make sure that it's the last thing in there. Yeah. <laughs> so we've discovered. <laughs> um, yeah, just sort of visual aid for yes, for thank everybody you. else. Um, yeah, there's a batch permission, batch patron permissions modifier plugin. It's great. It lets you make lists of people and, and give them permissions. Um, and I know that it needed an update after 2211. When when and our Koha got upgraded, I needed to grab a new version of the plugin. Yeah, we did that too. Um, and then in when you install that plugin, it inserts into your internet user JS a whole bunch of its own JavaScript. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that makes sense. It, as as George said, if it's appending this, I can see it accidentally deleting anything. If I after were to, it. Yeah, if I were to right now add some highly important jQuery down here. Yes. Yeah. Um, that should all be logged really well too. It, in it, the action logs. It yeah, it was. It showed that it's I like, had deleted it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I oh, did yeah. not delete it. <laughs> I it, it was changing the configuration that deleted it, but I was the one who did it. So it logged it as me deleting the stuff. So. It should be logged if you have that log turned on. Yeah, yeah, that's a fair point. If your system is saving changes to system preferences in the logs, um, it should, every time you edit internet user JS, mm -hmm. it should save the entirety of it. So like theoretically, you maybe could have gone back to the, the edit before that edit, but it also, it's messy. Um, yeah, it strips all the formatting, which yeah. is, I would hate to take this and try to shove it back into that box and make it right. readable again. That would be a long day or week. So I'm very time. glad I was well documented and backed yeah. up and yeah. But it was a shock at about five o'clock on a Friday afternoon. So. Yeah. As George says in the chat, well documented yeah. and backed up is the way to go. You learn that lesson early on as a system administrator. Yeah. Some days I think I could get like really over involved and like make a Git repository of the contents of our internet user JS. And then I decide I don't care that much. But I, like maybe <laughs> that, that's what I do. Yeah. yeah. It seems worthwhile. I wrote a report to get me all the data so I can just pump it into a Git repository once a month. No, nice. Yeah. I think that's been one of the most interesting. We we migrated in November 2022. The most interesting things is just learning all because we, we were Symphony Library for 30 years and I managed it for 20 years. So I knew what was going to happen in Symphony. Sure. And now I'm I'm remembering just as I'm going through and finding these little things that I guess I didn't know that and learning all this stuff for new again. So it's been a fun year in yeah. odd ways. There's always a, a, an interesting idiosyncratic collection of rakes to step on. Yes. Yeah. Mike says, our batch patron permission modifier is not at the end of internet okay. user JS. Sounds like I should move it to the end. Yeah, sounds like that would be safe. <laughs> I've, don't think of it as moving that to the end. Think of it as putting all the stuff after it to the front.
Well, that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm working on some custom POS reports and I wanted to create a report that showed me uh, totals for all of my different um, funds and payment types and whatnot that, you know, all the money coming in. And I wanted to union it with a report that would show all of the refunds. So all the money coming in and all the money that had to be refunded from a register. So I've got so many reports going right now. Anyway, I, I think I accomplished it somewhat, but as far as the union, but it seems like on the side where you're taking the money, everything is associated with your register. But when you're refunding the money, it doesn't look like that refund is being associated with a register. So when I put the, created the drop down so that you could run the report, you know, based on which register you wanted, of course, then I didn't get any of the refund side because it's like, those don't seem to be associated with a register. So then I wondered, is there a way to run a report to sort of hack it somehow that it's kind of like, yes, I know you don't have a register on that side, but I still want you to report data. Like, you know, can I run it with, I want it to be this register or blank, you know, and accomplish my transactions that come in on the one side, but my refunds that aren't associated with register on the other side, if that even makes sense. I mean, it sounds like it should be doable. I mean, <laughs> might end up restructuring your report somewhat just kind of based on where your where is. And because, yeah, you should be able to say where for actual sales register is blah, 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 but where for refunds register is no or is whatever. It's, it felt like my my selection of the register in the where was controlling like both sides of my union, but you're thinking that it shouldn't have to do so. Okay. I'm not good at this union stuff and so, but I'll I'll go poke around. And it seemed odd to me that a refund isn't associated with the register you're running it through. That does seem weird to me too. And I, I'd be kind of inclined to do a refund and then like really trace that data through every table because- I, I did the account that. offsets. Yeah. And, and, you know, looked at everything in an account offsets and it, it looked like, it looked like it's not recorded on a refund. What kind of refunds are you doing? Because I, I, that's the part that really tripped me up when we were getting cash registers is refunding things. Mm -hmm. I don't even, we well, needed a way to refund things that actually weren't entered in in the first place. And that isn't possible at all. <laughs> but we just do a sale and then count as a snake. It's weird. But I'm just curious about your refunding process. Well, so we have, multiple different things that CERT staff is, is telling me. So they might sell your earbuds and the person comes back and these don't work, give me my money back. So we, we see how to do that in the POS. That makes sense to us. And then sometimes we have somebody that comes in with a lost book and they pay for it. And then in the afternoon, you know, oh, I found it. You know, and so we do a refund for that. But then we have refunds where the person paid for the lost item and two months down the line, they find the item. And we have like a six month return policy. 
And at that point, we can refund them in COHA, but that refund isn't going to come out of our register. That refund is going to be issued by our finance department. So that is tripping me up a bit when I look at like the cash up summary reports because that gets included. But that's not really coming out of my drawer. Yeah, that's, we just ran into that too. And we decided to handle those as if we were just, we, we had to make it so that we were canceling the re refund and like we would if we didn't want somebody to get a refund. And then, it, I don't know, we're still having trouble with that same thing. Yeah. And I'm, I'm needing to do it per, they want stuff, you know, by totals by cash, totals by credit card, totals by check. And I also have city friends and foundations. So I've got all these levels of reporting and it's, um, yeah. <laughs> but the refunds are, are you know, if, if everything was on a cash basis and it all happened just in that day, then then I completely understand how everything is working. But um, and then I, I guess another question was, like, we've got this old antiquated cash register. And so CERC staff says, well, sometimes one of those staff might, um, you know, key the sale in wrong, you know, so they say it's a friend sale when it actually should have been a city sale. And so they would be able to run a report on this old antiquated cash register, and then they would spot their mistake, and they'd be able to go and fix it before they closed out for the day. And I'm not really seeing when it looks like when you cash up, you know, you don't really know what all those amounts are until you cash up because it says, you know, confirm you're removing this amount of money from the drawer and you say, yes, I am. And then it gives you this report um, with different totals and stuff. Um, but it's like, there's no way to go back in that particular day and fix things. Do you ever run into something like that? It hasn't been so bad since we got, we started using Koha. It feels like staff aren't making mistakes as often, which is interesting. That would be good. Yes, I like hearing that. <laughs> but yeah, um, I haven't particularly heard that, because you know, our staff didn't really reconcile when they ran the cash up before we had Koha do it. It was the business office. And she just explained, you know, she in her email to City that this is how this is and all that kind of and, and worked her magic. And so um, staff didn't have a way to really fix those mistakes after the fact anyway, except if they did notice, like if they said, oh, I accidentally rang that in as friends and it wasn't, they could go back. And we, I realized I had to give everyone permissions to do anonymous refunds in order to do that. And I hadn't given those permissions to everyone because it sounded scary. <laughs> I'm not sure I know what an anonymous refund is. It's basically doing the refunds in the POS area. Oh, okay. <laughs> it just sounds really scary when it says allow them to do anonymous refunds. Okay. But yeah, I... I'm not sure about that one. And I know that we were struggling with the same thing where somebody, we don't allow staff to refund over $50. And so it has to go through the business office. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to remember our steps that we do, but we don't handle it like a normal refund. Okay. Well, I might get back with you and ask you some more questions. I also just wondered when you're doing just like any report, when you get the output, is there a way to like, I've got some, you know, totals for this group and totals for this group because I'm unioning things. Is there a way to like make certain, a certain part of, of your report, um, you know, like give it style, like make it bold so that I can see that that total is, you know, bold compared to the rest of my lines? Yeah. Um 
for styling a report, the easiest way to do that is, is kind of hacky, but you just concatenate HTML into the, the output. So like if you've got a column that is giving you a total, instead of just saying, give me some of amount, concatenate like the HTML to make it bold. So like a bracket right. of the inner bracket with then your total and then the like closing bracket for that. That makes make more sense in text. You were not you were nodding like that all track. But it was weird. I, I I sort of understand. So, and I think I I think I have seen some examples, um, just going through some things, and just um, I'll just have to try it. Thank you. Here, Here. I may as well like give an example. Oh, yeah. Here we are. It's my borrower. Yeah, Who am I? Yeah. Okay, so if we just do that, we get it. So that's my name. But Oops. Oh, right. Pardon me while I'm bad at HTML and typing. I don't know why I named that, but there we go. Yeah, and so that just it makes the output of that column, it like turns it into something that gets parsed as HTML in the report. So and I can make that a little more clear if I maybe add. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and like, if I export that, it gets gross. Oh, okay. What do you have then? Where did that go? Oh, like it has given me the literal HTML there in my export. Yeah. I know I've seen a bug somewhere suggesting a yeah. feature to allow that to get automatically stripped when you export something. And I don't know if that ever went anywhere. But I remember talking about that idea at some point. What? Anyway, I love shoving HTML into a report. It's fun. Thanks. I will try some of those tips. Does anybody else have? Admin or reportsy things that we're working on. I just have a quick quick question. We we're talking about plugins a little bit earlier, and if you are using a plugin but you have a suggestion to improve it or whatever, do you guys know the the method of suggesting those suggestions? Um. Technically, you can most plugins like if they're on Git. There's a place on Git to file an issue. Um, so like here, if I go to Firewater's GitHub, I've got all their plugins here. The tab here for issues. So just like submitting a bug on Bugzilla, if I, I think yeah, I could make a new issue here and mm -hmm. say this plugin doesn't work in such a such way. Um, and that would generate a message to whoever at Bywater gets this email. But I could probably put a ticket into Bywater too if they were the one who made it. Yeah, I, if it were Bywater, Bywater, I would probably do both. Mm -hmm. yeah, Thank like, you. <laughs> there should be, I've seen plugins on like, um, 
GitLab as opposed to GitHub, and I think it has a similar issue thing. You can also, if you see an issue and you know how to fix it, you can just you know, do the work in GitHub and submit a request to make it part of the code. That's more advanced, though, so. I just finally under started learning how to use GitHub and figuring out where the code is actually on the, like, I could get to them and I couldn't ever find the code, but now I'm starting to figure that out, so. Um, over in the chat, George shared the bug to strip HTML from downloaded reports, which we will all note is sadly a four-digit bug number, which means it's over 10 years old and nobody's working on it, alas. Fair enough. Um, I don't know how I would like figure out what HTML it needs to get stripped and what isn't. Well, that's uh, if you look down there, I put a comment on that bug a couple of years ago that said I would want to be able to to determine whether or not I wanted that scrubbed or not. Yeah, that's fair. Oh, look, yeah, in 2021, I was here. Uh, and Michelle says that they've been working with Kyle on the overdue notices plugin and possibly make him re making him regret the coding of that plugin in the first place. Yeah, fair enough. I'm staring at you all. Willing you to have questions. The sandbox I started to make when Barbara was talking about refunds just finally split up if we wanted to look at refund data and try to figure out if it does somehow tie to a, to a registry. That's a good threat. Have questions? Oh, we'll look at account lines data. Well, can I ask my question before oh, we yeah. go there in case Please. we run out of time? What I am trying to do is I have a library where we normally don't allow holds on other libraries in the consortium. So you can only place holds on your own library, except if the item is unavailable in your own library. And I can't find a way to do that in COA, but Charles was at COACon last year and he said there was a talk that said using the setting the library limits and the transport cost matrix would enable me to do that. And there was a recording, but it stops early. <laughs> so. I can't think how the transport cost matrix would have anything to do with on-shelf availability. Yeah. Bob might be the person to ask about that. I know that he works a lot with the transport cost matrix, and I know that he has some limitations that he has set with certain libraries. He might be the person to ask. Okay, sorry. I missed who was that to ask, Christopher? Uh, Bob Benhoff. Bob. Okay, I will do that. Thank you. The transport cost matrix shouldn't make it, you know, shouldn't have anything to do with whether or not something is available, um, can I fill a hole. Transfers, excuse me. Oh, okay. Transfers well, that was, might do well that. that was one thing that Daphne mentioned was she said transport cost matrix, but that shouldn't prevent a hold if other items are, are, uh, if, if items are available, if only it, it shouldn't prevent that circumstance, I don't think. Yeah, it's a it's a broader switch. It can items go from this library to this library at all. It's not even like by item type or by circ rule. It's just across the board. OK, and presumably that would only come into play when you're filling the hold anyway, rather than when you're placing the hold. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
See the circulation rules. There's a place there that says on shelf holds available. Yeah, but it's not going to make the sort of per branch distinction that you right. want it to make. Huh. You see that thing, George, is like the old in the olden days. We used to say if the book was on the shelf, the library Come staff are not going to get it. Go get it yourself. Yeah. And then if it wasn't on the shelf we'd let you place a hold mm -hmm. and then we just said we would allow on um shelf holds and certainly we did that everywhere during the pandemic but what they're saying is you know i'm in my library and the book is not available right now so let me place a request on another library now i think logically what could happen is by the time it comes from the other library the local one could be back yeah you know but they're quite happy to to deal with that but i can find a way in cohad to bring in whether a thing is available but in another location i don't think it's possible so this is at library a patron at library a wants library a's copy of a book but library A's copy is checked out, so they can only in that instance place a hold on any other library account. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hmm. I don't know if you could even accomplish that by like creating a new patron category, which I would be really hesitant to do, even if it would work, because it's a whole like thing. Mm. A lot so are, are they placing item level holds then because doesn't i thought if you placed a hold on a bib level it just filled it with the home library first if it was available and then went to the others but does that have to do with how the holds queue is built yeah um so um, yeah, because I think, as I said, ordinarily we don't allow holes in another library. So I think you set those limits further down on the start confined rules. Mm. Um, but it's just we kind of want to bypass those in a scenario where the local copy is either checked out or damaged or, you know, withdrawn or something. Uh, Rebecca Court put a bug in chat that, that gets to what you were saying, Juliet, about prioritizing the home library or other libraries when multiple copies are available. And there's there is some logic in there that every time I need to think about it, I have to like clear 10 minutes first. Yeah, that's the thing about holes, isn't it? You think yeah. you understand what you want <laughs> and you need a little lie down. <laughs> Oh, yeah, Michelle makes a good point. I did see uh, the consortial SIG of Koha US is gearing up for a big hold conversation. If you have things you would like to see hold do, oh. or I suppose stop doing. Can anyone attend even if they're not in a court consortium? Yeah. Sure. But it's going to be geared specifically um, Specifically, this is stemming from an issue uh, that is specific to consortia. So currently in COHA, there is local holds priorities. And I'm in a situation here where I have uh, some libraries, like I have one school district. Um, and I have one district library where there's one library with four branches. And then there are, you know, 46 other libraries in the consortium. And so what um, the main thing that we wanted to start talking about is a way of saying local holds priority says if the, you know, if if the item is here at this library, give priority to to uh, a person checking that's placing the hold to be picked up at this library. So if the person is places the hold in their number 20 on the waiting list if the hold is the first one to be picked up at that library then that one fills it it hops the the cold skew to the front and what we want is a something that will say first give priority to the people at this library 
and then give priority to the people in this group and then give priority to everybody else in the consortium or to organize it in such a way that it could also say give people to uh, priority to all the libraries in this group and then all the other libraries and so that's what we're specifically going to talk about um, that's going to lead off the conversation so if that's something you want to discuss um, you're welcome to come but if that's something that's just going to bore you for a half an hour because you are a library that only has one one building then um, it might not be something you're interested in so it sounds fascinating um i have it failed is. To, i failed to make it to any of the consortial sig meetings those of you who have attended do you feel like a large multi-branch system generally is enough like a consortium that those big conversations would tend to be helpful uh i think some of them uh in a lot of respects you know compared to other places i've worked next search catalog is almost one big multi-branch system because i only have two groups inside there as opposed to one the the last library i was at which there was in the whole consortium there were only two libraries that weren't part of other groups so uh so yeah there i think there's some advantages of of uh that might be for like how many how many branches do you have andrew oh we're we're small we have five yeah yeah but yeah like, forget it you got yeah, nothing but, but rebecca <laughs> over in arlington they're they've got more complicated yeah they're huge them. yeah they're a lot they're really big so well um, and like rebecca i know you've got like the, your detention center branch that is all like a whole oh that's a whole branch. other level of weirdness <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah it's a we have eight locations and there's discussion about another one coming with the amazon hq2 opening in oh. uh here in Arlington. So there's discussion about a third or a ninth branch opening up down there. Um, well, that does get into that space. Like, I bet that branch is going to be weird. I bet they're going to do things different than the other libraries. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But that no, I think I think George's, you know, conundrum of how you, you know, game the system so that the ones at your branch get the book first. So you cut back on all this transit time could be of use to anyone anywhere, you know, so um if we could figure out a way like the transportation cost matrix is a great thing but right now we're seeing with the whole key report if it's on the shelf at the branch where that first patron is picking it up it's not even paging there or it's sending it to the whatever the transportation matrix says that should be going to as opposed to having this kind of logic that says oh yes this makes sense if it's on the shelf at the branch and the person who wants it is at the branch give it to that person first so I think, you know, having a more robust hold system in general, I think would be very beneficial for all who use Koha. Well, and I can't say there isn't room for some sort of um, more intentional approach to building holds from the ground up. Whereas like Koha right now, I, like the, the bug you linked about the hold queue was a really good example. That, that is adding customization to some very base level logic in the hold queue script that had kind of been forgotten over time. I'm like, oh yeah, this does have a hard coded preference deep down inside that we kind of didn't know was there. And I think holds are like that. They've been, they've accumulated over time. On that topic, I just tossed a bug into chat that I had forgotten existed and is worth being aware of. This is bug 29002, add ability to book items ahead of time, which right now is at failed QA. And I don't know, it's, it's a fascinating idea that I, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've all been asked about before. This is the patron who wants to make sure that such and such movie is available on September 13th so they can watch it on their anniversary. How do I place a hold that makes sure this thing will be here on September 13th and not beforehand? But even if you allow it, Andrew, how do you know the person who you say has to bring it back on the 12th will actually bring it back on the 12th? That's the answer I've given to every patron who has ever asked me this question and why I have always said it's impossible. So I'm interested to see how this module works and if it goes anywhere. It's a cool idea, but I don't know how you accomplish it without a staff member that goes around to libraries and or to, to homes and takes books back. Yeah. 
Library Police in Dubai. Sorry, that's kind of a weird wrench of a possible future feature that's not even here yet. But with a, a good bit of Bugzilla archaeology. And see, yeah, I do like that y'all were immediately listing ways this would be cool and helpful if it works. I'm right there with you. I want this to work. It relies on people, so it can't be foolproof. Yeah, uh, uh, an enhancement to replace our patrons with that GPT. Just AI patrons who check things out and return them on time. Has anybody developed a Karen GPT? Like an AI that's just a Karen? Like a, a mad? AI yeah, like a really angry AI. I guess that's kind of uh, oxymoronic. I have a brief, brief question on plugins. Yeah. Mm. Um, so it was odd because in the past month, I think it was the end of June, we needed to update our plugins. And then in, I think it was the end of July, beginning of August, we needed to update them again. So what's happening is, is I'm not being alerted. And so I'm all this, I'm noticing because I'm in acquisitions, like, uh oh, the EDI invoices they aren't coming in or what's going on here. And then, you know, I contact Bywater. It's like, oh, you need to update your plugins. And I was like, well, this is odd. It's like two in one month. So am I just supposed to check that periodically or how do you guys do that? Know when it needs to be updated? That's a really good question. As I'll admit, I've kind of relied on the wait until something looks like it's broken method, which is not ideal. That's kind of what I've relied on too. And what I think is going on is that there'll be a, a new version of Koha and uh, it breaks a plugin. And so about a month or so after the, a lot of people have upgraded, people start to realize the plugin's broken. So they start pestering the plugin developer and the plugin developer fixes it. And, uh, and there's no real good mechanism for tracking those because everybody has different ones. And so it's just kind of like a, an inevitability. So I try and check the plugins every time there's an upgrade um, yeah. and, and test them, you know, after, after an upgrade to make sure they're working right. And, and if they're not, then I go and look and see if there's an update. And if there isn't, then I would contact the, the per person or people that created the plugin. So. Um, it does look like GitHub gives you the ability to, to watch a, a repository and get an update when there's a new release. And like, that would be kind of helpful. You would at least know if Bywater has released a new version of their plugin, they theoretically did that for a reason. Um, I've not used this at all, but it looks like this button here. You could tell it to let you know when there is a new release. Then all you have to do is watch your GitHub account. Yeah, that would at least let, yeah, let you know if there is a version of this plugin, which probably fixes something that broke. Great, thanks, Andrew. Oh, you're welcome. That is still ultimately relying on someone noticing that something is broken, but I don't. That's kind of the, the trade-off of plugins, ultimately, is they're outside of the Koha development process. So Koha absolutely can and will wander away from the plugins, and then the plugins need to be brought back in line. It would be nice if there was some sort of alert uh, that said, hey, uh, you've got this version of this plugin, and we notice that there's an, a newer version. Maybe we should write a plugin to alert you of which plugins are out of date. There you go. A plugin plugin. Well, and 
to be perfectly honest, every plugin theoretically, when you load it up in Koha, tells you which version of the plugin are you using and which version of Koha does it correspond to. And those values don't seem to get updated carefully in most of the Koha plugins I've seen. Like they just kind of get left saying old version numbers. And so that would, that data would have to get made like, accurate for your plan to work which is like theoretically possible in theory people can put accurate version numbers in the code they write um lori sorry that's the long pause as i matched up initials to name lori asked um are the plugins updated on a certain schedule and no they're not really plugins are kind of unregulated make plugins whenever you want update them whenever you want um which yeah again it's like why they're a little more dangerous there's not a big community making sure they get updated they're more sort of one individual user or maybe a few people generally i wouldn't expect plugins to break outside of a koha version update I wouldn't expect the monthly Koha point releases to change something enough to break a plugin. There will absolutely be exceptions to that. But yeah, broadly, I'd expect new plugin versions to pop up shortly after a new Koha version. For those that have been on Koha a really long time, has there ever been a plugin that's made it into the actual Koha? Oh, yeah. For sure. The newest one is the uh, curbside uh, curbside plugin. That's that part of Koha now. Look, another example of the jump to I'm forgetting where it went. Oh, the, the patron emailer, although that's kind of it's cranky right now. Or maybe the, the community is cranky about patron emailing. There are other things like we talked earlier about the web pages, and that was used to be a hack. And then somebody finally, after you know 15 years, made it part of the system. And honestly, yeah, any plugins that are seeing a ton of use are great candidates for getting actually moved into Koha proper because then they would be in the Koha development process. Like basically, if we took that patron permission modifier and moved it into Koha proper, no one would be allowed to change Koha in a way that would break the permission functionality, which right now you are. I'm allowed to change Koha code, do whatever I want to permission without concern for whether or not it will continue to play with the plugin because the plugin's not in Koha proper which is not ideal. The trade-off being then like, nobody had to go through the whole community QA process to get that plugin up and running and usable. So sacrificing control for flexibility. Okay, so back to little apologies for that. We're at 10.51. We have nine more minutes of, of brilliance, and then we all go dumb. Oh, that's a good question. Michelle asked, does anyone know what happened Friday afternoon with searching? I was on vacation, but when I opened Slack on Monday morning, I did see that something had happened. All I heard was elastic search broke, but okay. apparently it, it was you know, server wide, it, it wasn't isolated to any particular uh, server. So I'm just glad it wasn't a three day weekend because it broke here like at 4 30. It broke here while we had a tech working on our sorter and doing upgrades. And so they kept saying, you know, it's not 
it's not us, it's them. And we're like, um, well, and then we figured out it was co-op, but they had a problem on their side too, so. It doesn't sound like anyone's privy to greater detail. Looking at Bywater's status um, page that they have, they're not very forthcoming with with the information. And generally, in the past, you know, when when I've had when we've had issues, and they said, "Okay, it's fixed," I would press them for at least a little bit of an explanation. But uh, you know, if if they're not pressed for information, they just generalize things, which is a little frustrating. It would be like it would be nice to know a little bit about what's going on, so we have some sort of reference. You know, like if something else happened down the road, you could say, "Oh, well, that sounds like such yeah, and such." Yeah, you do want to be able to maybe provide some some constructive feedback if they're continuing to make the same errors and crash things in the same way. I don't like having to explain yeah. to our consortium. Uh, it's just no worky. Yeah. <laughs> That's all we get. <laughs> I've talked to IT and they have confirmed that it is broken. Well, I was just wondering if it, it, that's the first time it's happened. We've been on since February. So I was wondering, is this a common occurrence? Does it happen like every few months or should we be aware of that? Uh, Fridays in the summer on Cape Cod, very busy. So it's like we're just anything we could tell our people to not be um, upset about that we can give some sort of information would be helpful. So yeah, uh, we shared the status page, but it really, there was no explanation or any hint as to what happened. So it is, it is extremely rare. Okay. You, know, you know, when we get upgrades, you know, they try to work out a lot of the kinks and bugs and try to figure these things out well in advance. But, you know, until it hits production and it, you know, and it's in mass load, uh, you know, sometimes some things, you know, crop up unexpectedly, but, you know, for the most part, the downtime on Koha has been, you know, extremely low compared to our other ILSs that we've been in. Yeah, for me, it's been uh, like 11 years now that I've been using Koha with Bywater Solutions and this doesn't maybe once or twice a year there's a problem like this but you know the worst ones i remember one time where it was like july 3rd 4th 4:45 and then the friday before labor day at you know at uh, 402 and you know and it took larry like 2 hours to get us back up you know it, it seems like the times that it has happened to me it's always been like right before a 3 day weekend so that's something to look forward to, I guess. And George, you and I fondly remember our previous ILS where it could be down for days. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, somebody putting a decimal in the wrong point, you could be down for three days. Um, the situation there too was different because uh, their US office, we were in, in the Pacific time zone, their US office was in the central time zone and their headquarters was in Israel. So the lines of communication were stretched. And, uh, and so it was, it was a nightmare. And, and that was, that was one thing I would say, you know, when um, I was homesick when this happened on Friday and other people were, you know, sending me, my phone was, was going off and people were texting me saying, who, where should I send an email? Who, what should I do? And I just, my, my best advice for getting by water to help you with anything is don't is go ahead and send an email and go ahead and use the, the ticket ticketing system, but also phone um, and ask them to call you back. And when they call you back, you can ask what's going on, what happened. Um, but I, re I always recommend phoning. I phoned and when they routed my call, Todd picked up and he said, you're having trouble with searching, aren't you? So they already knew and, you know, he couldn't give me a lot of information, but he said they're, they're on it, they're working on it. And 
you know, hoping to get it quick. And it, it was a little while, but not too bad. I'm glad to hear y'all um, say more or less the same thing I would have said about frequency of outage. I wasn't um, entire, entirely confident in my uh, impression of it, given that I, I worked for Bywater longer than I worked in a Bywater uh, supported library. So I don't, yeah, I don't feel like I'm super impartial, but I would have also said outages are rare. From the like insider perspective, I will say Bywater is a small enough team that you definitely, they will run into issues where like either I can fix this for you right now, or I can explain to you how it's broken. I can't do both and there's nobody else to help. So like the explaining part's gonna need to wait. And they're as a whole, not great at remembering to follow up on stuff like that. Like I'm not surprised by Mike's comment that he asked for a postmortem and never got a response. That sounds in character. And if you keep asking them, they will keep wholeheartedly intending to get around to writing that email that explains what went wrong. I, it is not ever my impression that Bywater gets secretive out of a desire to be secretive, but rather like they forget you have to put words outside your head for people to know them. That's one of the reasons I like calling is because I'll usually call and, and I'll say, you know, it, it's not working. And then they say, okay, is this a good number to reach you back? And then when they call back, then I say, do you know what happened? And most of the time, by the time they fixed it, they usually know what happened and they can answer that question. So Yeah, and I think Todd and the support people have a pretty good understanding of like one of their important roles is to be the person who follows the devs and the systems team around and says, okay, but really what happened? People need to know. And, and another thing I'd say about calling when there's a problem is you get, is you get to talk to people like Todd. You know, you get a, you know, I've, I've, remember calling about one thing and then ending up talking to Todd about for, for like a half an hour. So, uh, and the same with when Larry was there, Larry and I could have a conversation that last, you know, an hour and 45 minutes. And, and when we, when you're done, it's like, what do we talk about? That's why I can never get a hold of anybody. George is on the phone. <laughs> yeah. It's I'm, I'm all getting all the Bywater phone lines. Yeah. That's such a not, that's not a selling point for me. Like if I call them with my problem, I'll have to make small talk. Oh no. Hey, Larry was always a blast to talk to. I, I miss Larry, so. And with that, y'all, the clock has struck 11. Or, you know, adjust for your time zone. Does anybody have any final questions or concerns or, I don't know, philosophical statements? I think um, I'll see y'all in New Hampshire. I believe that's how time works. When we next meet, it will be at Koha, no, Koha US, not Koha, I have to make sure the name Anyway, hope to see you in Portsmouth or on Zoom from Portsmouth or whatever. All right, go forth and be amazing. Thank you very Thank much. Bye. 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 Bye.